move definitely changed everything because we felt a bit more professional, future leaning. We had an influx of kit. We had Red Bull just dropping off fridges full of drinks, all these freebies. Uh, Sony throwing money at us and the building was like super cool. We were all quite young and, and anybody you can think of. I mean, real sort of recluse type programmers who would just sit in the corner and just really enjoy, you know, what they were doing. And then you had people that were going out clubbing and, you know, maybe investigating various chemical opportunities. Okay, here's a fact that's bound to upset practically everyone who watches this video. Right now in 2024, we are closer to the year that the first Wipeout game takes place than we are to the year it came out. Wipeout was a launch title for the original PlayStation in Europe in 1995. Set in 2052, the game had you compete in an anti-gravity racing league in circuits all around the world. And while its gameplay was certainly enjoyable, the critical elements to Wipeout's success were two things, style and speed. Let's start with the latter. Back in the mid-90s, games didn't look this fast, especially in 3D. When the original Sonic came out, it blew everyone away with its blast processing powered speed. But the days of 2D were ending, and even though Sonic was only released three years before the PlayStation came out, it was already considered to be from a bygone era. The first Wipeout was a PlayStation 1 launch title, and it cannot be underestimated just how much of a revolution in gaming that console was. Suddenly, most games were in 3D, and Wipeout was the most 3D game you'd ever seen. It was the game that lucky PlayStation owners would show their friends to demonstrate how powerful this new console was. But speed can only get you so far, and it was Wipeout's style and aesthetic that made it a 90s cultural icon. Wipeout wasn't Mario Kart, it wasn't even F-Zero. Much like the PlayStation itself, Wipeout was a product aimed at the jilted generation, young adults who had grown up from speedy hedgehogs and were embracing the wider culture. You can see it in the game's advertising in the thoughtful art design created by British graphic design studio The Designer's Republic. And critically, you could hear it in the game's ambient sound effects, its slick engine sounds, and most importantly, its outstanding soundtrack with music from some of the biggest dance acts of the generation. Alongside one talented in-house musician who would go on to make some of the game's most iconic tracks, despite the fact that when he started on the project, he couldn't stand dance music. We're here today to talk about the sound and music of Wipeout, but really this is a story about so much more. It's about the transition to 3D, the changing mood that mainstream culture was having about video games. It's about the Liverpool-based studio Psygnosis, one of the most iconic British studios of all time. It's about sound design, writing music, and the power of creative collaboration. It's about one of the first ever implementations of licensed music in video games, something so commonplace today, it's hard to remember a time before it. But this story has to start somewhere, and seeing as this is a studio in Europe in the 1990s, it can be perhaps no surprise that our story starts in the Amiga demo scene. Teams of young programmers, artists and musicians who would compete with each other to make the most interesting games, animations and visual tricks they could. The proto-indie developers, all distributed on discs by hand. Also Pugsy. This story starts with Pugsy. Working at Psygnosis, basically my involvement with the Amiga, and the Amiga demo scene led me to be part of a couple of demo groups, but pointedly one called Dionysus. Yeah, a couple of guys from Liverpool, Lee and Alan. Well, I was already in one, Jester Brothers International, with my brothers and a couple of friends. And one thing led to another, and we created the Pugsy demo, a little character designed and a narrative. So he's this alien that's coming to Earth, doesn't really know what's going on, and he's a bit haphazard and a bit clumsy gets used and abused, uh, bitten by dogs, goes into a strip club not knowing what it is and gets thrown out with a pair of uh, ladies' knickers on his head and then he goes back to try and get away from it all in his spaceship and it won't start, he's got to fix it and, and ultimately he's going to destroy the earth because it's like, you know, screw you guys, 
hate this planet, bang. Um, and we stopped the demo at that point and said, you know, you could be responsible for what's going to happen in the future. And it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek, uh, if a software house wants to develop this guy into a game. So, yeah, we, we went down to a computer show, bizarrely in suits, because <laughs> the idea was we're taking this seriously. We had appointments with various software houses. They looked at the demo and went, yeah, we can see there's some talent there, but it's not our thing. We're kind of disheartened. It was the end of the day, and we thought, well, let's try Psygnosis, see if they've got any spare slots. And we waited outside, and we handed them a disc, and we met Ian Hetherington, uh, sadly, dearly departed. Um, quite recently actually yeah he just uh, was effervescent you know I love this demo it's a new style it's what we want it's great uh, what's with the suits though Psygnosis was one of the most beloved developers and publishers of this era. In the early 90s, they had released games like Second Samurai, Bob's Bad Day, and even Lemmings. We covered that in our documentary on DMA Design. Psygnosis crafted a stylish image around themselves, games with slick graphics and animations. Their logo became synonymous with a certain feel. They even hired acclaimed artist Roger Dean to make stylized box art for many of their games. In 1993, they were bought by Sony, and with that came a new office and business expansion. Psygnosis were always on the hunt for the next publishing hit. They liked Pugs in space and signed the three boys to make a game called Pugsy. The lads were paid to work on the title for a few months, but progress was slow. To find a solution that worked for both Psygnosis and the young developers, Ian Hetherington asked if they could pass along this project to the developers at Traveller's Tales. He bought the rights to Pugsy and offered the three of them jobs at Psygnosis. This is where Tim cut his teeth, writing the music and designing the sounds for some of the Amiga's most iconic games. And seeing as this was the era before optical media, not only did Tim have to make sure the game sounded good, he also had to make sure that they fit on the disc. I think my first job was uh, the game Awesome. Did stuff for that and then I was offered Shadow of the Beast 2. And I think that came out first actually. Shadow of the Beast 2 came out first, then Awesome. Had Shadow of the Beast 1 been like successful at that stage? I feel like that was one of Psygnosis' biggest beats. I mean, their thing back then was, uh, you know, it's got to look amazing. Animation's got to be great. The sound's got to be, wow, is that really coming from an Amiga? That kind of vibe. That had already come out. It had been, I wouldn't say massively well-received gameplay-wise, but, it, you know, all the reviews said, in typical Psygnosis fashion, it looks like a lovely cake. It <laughs> tastes like a lovely cake, but, you know, that's, that's as far as it goes. Gameplay's okay. Yeah. Incredible box art. Exactly, yeah, Roger Dean, you know, did all the Yes albums and stuff. Um, and yeah, you would be approached, there's a game, here it is, you've got four weeks. And how much RAM have I got for my samples? Oh, don't know, hang on a minute. Oh yeah, 10K or something. It's like, what? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe we can load some stuff later. And, you know, it's very much an afterthought with a lot of games, not everybody. If you wanted to get on, you would provide the music, the sound effects, obviously all of the sampling, or anything to do with that audio side of things, and a play routine, and it would just go into the, the game. They would just call various callbacks, and it would start the music, end the music, change the tune that was playing, fade in, fade out, trigger this sound effect, trigger that sound effect. The move towards 3D created a huge shakeup across the UK game scene as many Amiga developers did not survive the transition. Industry leaders like Sensible Software, Chrysalis and the Bitmap Brothers would never make that leap. But Psygnosis did survive and in fact created some of their most popular games in 3D. They developed and published a murderer's row of classics during the second half of the 90s. Games like Destruction Derby, Colony Wars, G-Police, Overboard and Roll Cage. Of course it was, uh, you know, it's of a culture shock really um, definitely for the programmers having to learn to code 3d the hardware was different to the Amiga and some of the earlier sort of 2d platforms you know like Mega Drive and so on there was no real concept of that per se yeah and for the artists they've got to learn new things they've got to embrace a 3d package you know how do I design objects in 3d I mean it, it really is total culture shock. They can still use their 2D skills for producing UI and that kind of thing. But, you know, if you've got to build a spaceship or a racing car or, or, or a vista that you fly over or drive through, 
yeah, massive, massive learning curve. For the musicians and the sound effects guys, not so much. It's more sort of like a breath of fresh air, because, okay. Wow, I was doing everything sequenced. So everything's being played real time. And now, hopefully I can do CD audio. So I, I, I'm a proper musician now. Although that caused problems as well, because people who didn't have the chops, you know, there's other musicians out there, you know, the ones on top of the pops, and, you know, hit chart, chart hits, and uh, all those classical orchestras, you know, 45, 12 piece chamber orchestra, whatever. You're now essentially competing with those people. You're in house, and we go to you first, but don't rely on it. So, a kind of nerve wracking from that perspective. Tim had just finished the soundtrack to Crazy Ivan, a Nine Inch Nails inspired soundtrack, when the prototype of Wipeout was being worked on. A version of this prototype would later appear in the movie Hackers, only adding to the lore of this series. As was so often the case at Cygnosis, by the time Tim came on the project, they already had a playable version of Wipeout running. It just needed music. The only problem was Tim wasn't exactly a great fit for the type of music the development team was thinking of. Yeah, I was eventually made aware of the hackers thing at the same time roughly that I was being engaged to create music and sound effects for it. The, the way I was told was that Nick Burkham had been playing Mario Kart, but instead of the classic Mario music, he was just listening to basically dance music, techno, all manner of tunes of that ilk. And he'd mentioned, uh, I think, to one of the other graphic artists, oh, there's something in this. But wouldn't it be better if it was, you know, like a really f super fast, I mean, a really breakneck, uh, so the wheels were ditched, it's got to be flying, but then it's like, well, maybe it's stuff, you know, ships that hover around the track, and I think that's kind of loosely how it came about. And that's the point where I was brought on board. Look, these are the, th the tunes that we're looking at. So I was given various sample bits of music, um, I think some orbital stuff, uh, maybe a bit of left field, but then a whole host of other tunes. And would you have been into that scene before that? Like, no. were you producing music even in that? Well, okay. I hated it with a passion. Didn't like ambient, I didn't like uh, ele uh, that kind of techno, trance, acid. I was a child of the uh, kind of late 70s, early 80s. So there was a little bit of punk and ska and um, definitely new romantic. And then the synthesizer dudes like Human League, Depeche Mode, Tangerine Dream, Kraftwerk, Jean-Michel Jarre, Vangelis. So, that's quite a smorgasbord of, of, you know, styles. But anything with a synthesizer and a good melody. And then when I was asked to do Wipeout, I had a couple of tracks that I hadn't used in Crazy Ivan. So I lazily went, what about this one? And they went, this sounds like Crazy Ivan. I said, oh yeah, okay, fair enough. No, no, like this. And then they just handed me, you know, um, loads of CDs um, of where they wanted to go with it musically. So I listened to that and thought, oh no, not that, you know, whistle in your mouth, take a knee, kind of, you know, wee, repetitive, just tss, 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 where the bass line just goes, oh, oh, eh, eh, oh, 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 oh. I didn't get it. No, didn't like it at all. I was terrified, to be honest, because once that first track was turned down and then I was presented with, this is what we want, and it wasn't me and I didn't like it, I then thought, right, treat this professionally. It would have been something like future music. I would have gone through that and then picked out articles that would have been useful. And then there was a company called Time and Space based in the UK that were producing sample CDs that a lot of the top producers were using to create this kind of music. A lot of the Wipeout music lent on those CDs very heavily, but put together in a way that I thought, like me doing techno, me doing trance. The, I had a Roland JD800 and that was really good at doing squelchy sounds and some like really full-on distorted kick sounds. There's even a few Amiga sounds in there just for, you know, shits and giggles. I started doing that and was still like, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing and it's got to be breakneck speed so the BPMs were up really high. And then one of the girls, one of the, the girl artists came up and she said, oh, 
have you finished the track yet? And I said, yeah, pretty much. Oh, can I have a listen? Yeah. So I played it to her. And she was like nodding her head and going, oh, yeah, yeah, good, good, good. And I think it was about four minutes long. And she said, okay, so so you've got, you've done like sort of four or five. So you've got, how many are you doing? And I said, sorry. Well, you've got, you know, you've, You've done me sort of. You've played me four or five of your tracks there, and I said, "No, it's just one." What? But it sort of does this, and then it goes da 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 da, and then there's a new theme, and da 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 da, and this new theme. I said, "Yeah, that's because I'm shit myself. I don't know what I'm doing." So I'm just. I don't personally like do 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 do. You know, for like five minutes. So I did it for like thirty seconds. I'm getting bored. So we'll do a little transition and then new thing, and then we'll come back. You know, we'll we'll come back to that first refrain maybe near the end. And so that ended up being kind of like the cold storage sound. But I'm, I'm honestly, as I was doing it, I did. I I started to sort of enjoy myself. But the real thing was when they took me out to a nightclub. They said, "Look, you need to experience this. You, I know you're doing okay, but you don't really get it, do you?" No. So I went out. And I thought, right, let's get to the bar. Oh no, we're not drinking. Bottle of water. And they would drop in some, should we say, little tablets. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. But after about an hour, and I was covered in sweat, and I was just drinking loads and loads of water because I was having a full workout. And I got it, I finally got it. That slow transition, you know, where the hi-hats are sort of coming in and then going away, and then the bass is just, the filter's just getting tweaked slightly. It's music to dance to. It's not to be listened to. So then when you come back from the nightclub, and you've got your CD and you put it on, you're not really listening to it as a piece of music per se necessarily, you're remembering that great night you had at some nightclub somewhere, and it just gives you that buzz again. So that's why in Wipeout 2097, it's a bit more traditional in terms of it not being like seven themes glued together. The response from a lot of the record labels were, no, we, don't, we don't want to get involved in that nerdy, back bedroom gaming kind of scene. So then Wipeout was complete. We'd managed to convince these three bands to come on board. I think they kind of got it, that it was going to be cool. And then the advertising started. A young couple laying there with blood pouring out of their nose. Uh, You know, that kind of vibe. It was like really dirty and grimy and then it was aimed at all these people coming back from the club, high or drunk or whatever, and this is the after party. You know, they're playing with it. And it did really well, and the press loved it. And then announcement, yeah, we're making a second one. And it was just the phone, you know, the phone was off the hook from all the record labels going, we want a slice of this, how do we get in? talking to Nick, I don't know the exact conversation, but the gist of it was he was telling me, this is great you know, we haven't got like the pick of the bunch or whatever, but we've got so many options, it's, you know, it's really great and I said, uh, yeah okay, fair enough, but you'll still need me for the sound effects, won't you? And he went yeah, but you're not going to do music for this one, I said, right, okay if it's a choice between that fella called Cold Storage who the hell's he, and you know someone that no, 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 this is the games company, you're a games musician, you deserve a, a slot. I went on regardless, I thought, I'm going to have at least, surely I'm going to have at least one track here. And I'd always wanted to try and calm down and not be so nervous about these tracks have got to be, you know, full on 140, 150 BPM. How slow can I make this song? And it still be driving. Um, and at this point I'd listened to a lot of Chemical Brothers and Fatboy Slim and all the big beat guys. You know, you've got that You know, that whole whoa. And that's a real adrenaline pump when you hit that when you hear that BAM! That big drop. Okay, I'll take a leaf out of that book. Created a beat and then I just dropped the BPM, dropped it, dropped it, and I had wipeout running on the screen. And I got to a point where I thought, mm, okay, that's getting a bit dicey now. And I started playing. Now, bump it up another BPM. Mm, 
one more. Okay, perfect. That's as low as I'm going to dare go. Um, and then I completed that, and then I went down to the programmers, and I said, oh, I've got a track for the, for, for the next wipeout. Can you put it in? Because I think it's going to work okay, but 2097 looks a bit different. Yeah, sure. Da -da 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 -da, put it in, and then started playing it. Yeah, no, that's, that's going to work okay. And it was about 95% complete. You know, I'd mastered it a little bit. It wasn't long after, maybe two or three days later, and one of the uh, marketing girls, ladies I should say, uh, was, was down there. Anyway, she takes the headphones off and says to, I think it was Mark, one of the developers, yeah, that's coming along great. It's, oh, it's so much easier to play than the first one, not banging into the wall and slowing down and you know, because it had been made a little bit, you know, easier play-wise. And she said, um, yeah, yeah, great. And then she sort of turned to walk away and she goes, oh, by the way, is that, you just put that music on or is it one of the tracks? Oh, yeah, it's one of the tracks. It, uh, it's Tim. Oh, that's got to stay in. Love it. And walked off and I thought, okay. So I thought, I'll write one more. I might get one more in there. So I, I went up and I, I, I was messing around for a bit and then I found that sample, Body in Motion. And I thought, well, I'm just going to loop that through as a kind of a statement. Um, and then I, that one got in. Actually, I think that one was a bit dicey as to whether it would get in. Not that people didn't like it, but, you know, they had a, a roster and someone dropped out or something. And I said, oh, okay. I've got a backup. Oh, yeah, we'll just throw that in. When the first wipeout was being developed, we'd only recently kind of moved to Wavertree Technology Park. We'd originally been down in the docks in some old warehouses. I mean, they're okay, but they weren't ideally suited for game development. And they certainly weren't suited for me, because the room I was in had something like a 35-foot high ceiling with tin sheeting. So if it rained, snowed, or there were high winds, can you imagine trying to you know, mix music in that sort of environment? And it was cold, hence cold storage, that's where the name came from. In, in summer it was a delight, but in winter it was... There was a radiator in there, but I mean, all the heat was 35 up, you know, in the air. So I'd have to try and keep the door closed and hope it came down and people would come in, leave the door open. So I'd said to one of the programs, oh, screw this, I'm going back to cold storage. And then eventually I put cold storage on the door. Just, you know, as a kind of piss take. And then when, it, when Nick said, you don't really want to be on Wipeout as Tim Wright, do you? Why don't you come up with some sort of name? The shield, mines, and all that kind of thing. In the first one is actually a, a program on the Commodore Amiga, um, the, the speech synthesizer program. Uh, don't I sound just like a lady? And you can sort of change the phonemes a little bit. So I just got it to say all the things you it needed to, you know, electro bolt and all of that kind of thing. Sample those and then EQ'd them, so they're a little bit bass heavy, a little bit crispy, put it through a chorus, maybe a phaser and a few other effects, and then compress it so it's like, you know, so it's like that, you know, really tight and, and cuts through the, the sound effects and the music. So the other thing uh, in terms of sound effects, apart from the speech and you know, collision sounds and that kind of thing, are the engine sounds. One thing that I learned pretty quickly was, I thought, right, these are kind of like big, thrusting, roaring engines and they're going to sound amazing, and quickly became apparent that's the wrong approach. And it's actually, it was good. It's taught me to think about that kind of thing in a different way with, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, when you develop for motorcycle games or truck racing games or car racing games. So you get rid of all of that raw and all of the kind of meat of the engine. And it's all just about the wind noise and a little bit of uh, turbine whine and stuff like that. And the reason that that's important is because you need the space for the voice saying, you know, shields and all that kind of thing and the collision sounds, but mainly the music. Well, 
Tim's music stood shoulder to shoulder with tracks from some of the biggest artists in British dance music, a remarkable achievement considering he didn't even like dance music until he started working on this project. I'm a huge fan of the music from that era. My brother was in college during the late 90s and would frequently lend me CDs from artists like Left Field and Orbital, so I had to nerd out with Tim about his interactions with British dance music royalty. I got the opportunity to meet uh, Left Field, Orbital and Chemical Brothers. Uh, I was on stage with Chemical Brothers at one of their gigs in Liverpool, just as a hanger-on. You know, just like, yeah, just sort of hang about on the end of the stage there. So they were, they were cool. Orbital, I really kind of clicked with. Paul, uh, Paul and I sort of chatted for quite a while, but, you know, went to his house and went to the studio, played him, him and his brother, my crazy Ivan music, and they said, oh, cool, when did you release that album? I said, no, no, it's for, for the game Crazy Ivan. But it's out there, you've put it, no, get it out, put it out on an album. I still haven't, <laughs> it's still not out there. Uh, but I'm, I'm remedying this, hopefully. And Left Field, yeah, we didn't really get to chat with them too much, but we were invited to a few gigs and we went backstage with them a couple of times. And there was, I remember at the time, or you know, years later, wondering why Left Field weren't on the second one, but I guess, I think, Rhythm and Stealth didn't come out for a number of years after, so they probably just didn't have any music or something. It was, oh you know, my that was God. the case, or Rhythm and Stealth. Oh God, yeah. I love that album. It's just, I get shivers up my spine just thinking about it. It was a, th it's an all-timer. I'm so glad he's back making music as well. It's uh... yeah. It came out round about the time I got um, a 24 valve Fiat coupe, bright yellow with black interior, and it was. Stupidly fast. Dum da dum dum da dum 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 da dum dum, and I'd hit the accelerator. Poof. You cannot talk about the history of British game design without talking about Psygnosis. You can't talk about the history of Amiga games or PlayStation games without bringing them up. And as much as I love so many of their games for so many different reasons, there is something special about Wipeout that just can't be reproduced. Even after Sony rebranded Psygnosis as Studio Liverpool and they released some terrific Wipeout games of their own, it just wasn't the same. Not because these games didn't play well, but because there was no way of recapturing the moment in time in which Wipeout was released. A planet full of gamers used to looking at 2D sprites suddenly catapulted into a breakneck futuristic 3D world, but crucially, a world which reflected the growth of games into the wider culture, where for the first time the lines were blurred between the world on your TV and the world you experience with your friends on a Saturday night. The PlayStation Wipeout games are irreplaceable and unrepeatable, and I think that's what makes them so special. You just kind of had to be there. In terms of how it's propelled aspects of my work in life and career, I mean, it's just precious. It's uh, how lucky can you get? You happen to be working for the company in the UK that Sony want to throw a load of money into to develop for PlayStation. I mean, that's manna from heaven. And then to slide th through that and produce CD audio music for all of these games that you don't know which one's going to do well. But I mean, when you when I look back and I th and I see you know, the Shadow of the Beast stuff, Lemmings. I mean, thank you God or whoever the entity was that gave me that one. And Wipeout and Colony Wars. And, and some of the ones that I don't really think about that much, like Formula One and uh, Adidas Power Sports Soccer. And on the whole, I was a jammy bastard, basically. You know, <laughs> it, the, it fell nicely for me. So, yeah, I, it means the world, Psygnosis. The people... Um, the experiences, the projects. So it's a delight to do these kind of things. You know, you get to remember the, the, the good times and, and reminisce. <laughs>